Hello, Restore Community Church. It is my privilege to be with you this day and to teach from God's Word. I'm also equally privileged to teach the last uh, uh, teaching in this series that we've been running, which is the seven I am statements that Jesus made about himself. These are statements that Jesus invites us into seeing clearly who he claims to be. There are many other things and many other uh, words said about Jesus, but on this particular occasion, as he talks to his disciples, in a long, uh, as you see John writing, you know, it, many days he will be literally opening up himself to his disciples so that they will see clearly who he is. We're also invited to see just how he ties those statements about himself as a fulfillment of what happened or what was prophesied before or what happened in the past. And so he is not talking to strangers, he's talking to people who are familiar with the past, they're familiar with the culture, and they're familiar with some of these statements and what it would mean if someone invoked uh, or said these words uh, about themselves. So that's a wonderful thing. But before we jump into that teaching, let me say a prayer and then we can go on. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that we get an opportunity to listen to God's word, to hear what you're saying to us today. So I commit myself that I will be able to relay what you're saying. I also commit to those who are streaming in, watching this wherever they are, that today will be a day where they experience your voice and hopefully walk in the revelation that they have come into. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you have been tracking with us, we've spent a lot of our time in the book of John. And today we're in the book of John 15. Now I'll read the text for us today. It's John 15 uh, from verse, verses 1 and 2. And it says this, I am the vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. If you want to replace that word, he takes away. In some versions of the Bible you might be having, he says, he cuts it. <clears throat> Now, the book of John begins in a very interesting way. John chapter 2, especially, we come to the wedding, we say, call it the wedding at Cana. This is an opportunity where Jesus has been invited into a wedding. Jesus' mom has been invited into that wedding. His disciples are around that time in that wedding. And as it is the culture of the day, people will be consuming wine that, the very best of the wine, they'll be consuming it early in the day as they go on. And later in the day, uh, people will, produce, will bring forth uh, wine that's not high quality. So people would actually enjoy wine that's best at the very prime hours of the day, and then they'll, you, they'll give you uh, wine that's not of very high quality at the later parts of the day. But something happens on this particular day that Jesus is confronted with a lack. And he, what, what's a lack on this day? Wine runs out. I mean, it's a very, it feels like a very embarrassing thing. If you invited people to your ceremony and you're in charge of making sure that all the supplies for that day were met, and then something runs out in the middle of a ceremony like that. Isn't that so embarrassing to, and it feels embarrassing to me if that would happen to me. But something happens. Jesus' mother tells the people, ask Jesus or tell Jesus about the wine running out. And we know the story. Jesus goes ahead to say, fill the jars with water. And then he said, now serve it. And what went in as water comes out as 
the best wine they have ever tasted. I want you to hold that thought in your mind that Jesus intervenes in a moment of greatest need. In a moment that would seem so embarrassing to us, he steps in and he offers the solution. And it's not just a solution to get us by. It's the best solution of the time. And it opens the eyes of the people to ask, who is this? And maybe you are finding yourself in that place where you feel something has just interfered with your life. And you feel like God cannot see that. I will come back to that thought. But as we go on, I want you to hold to that thought that the God of the universe has just broken through into our natural realm and has opened our eyes to see that he is able to provide us with the very best. And in this case, he's able to provide us with the best wine. And that's why they exclaimed, you have saved the best wine for the latter part of the day. God has saved the best wine. I was coming to that. But rushing quickly into John 15, something happens. Jesus makes this grand statement to a people who would understand in the Mediterranean world how to grow grapes and out of those grapes to produce great wine. I've traveled many parts where grapes are grown and uh, I'm not a big, far, uh, big wine drinker as many some people are. But I've also come to discover that different wines come from different parts of the world and come from places that have different weather conditions. And so every wine that comes from a different part of the world will taste slightly different. Those who uh, love wine will tell you the differences of, 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 those, of those grapes and where they come from. And so the people listening to Jesus are familiar with this when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Also, let's move on. The people listening to the words spoken to them about Jesus being the vine and they being the branches are also familiar that Jesus is referencing something from the Old Testament. Because the word vine has always, in the Old Testament, been a picture of Israel. And so Israel, for all this while, has been God's vine. And God visits the vine because God's garden, he plants Israel, or he plants this vine in his garden. And God visits the vine as often as he can as the vine dresser and wants to see, did I make a good investment? Just to open your wide, eyes wider to this fact, let's go to Isaiah chapter 5 and I'll read from verses 1. Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah writes this concerning Israel as the vine. And he says, let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. But he built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it and he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between yourselves. O judge between me and the vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard? 
that I had not done, it, done for it. When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you, what I will do to my vineyard, I will remove it, I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured, and I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste, it shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord's host is the house of Israel. So that's the rebellious side of Israel. When God uses this metaphor of a, of, of a vine, of a vineyard, he says, Israel, my people, is my vineyard. And I came to them to look for fruit because I am the one who planted them. But I did not find the right grapes. I found wild grapes. Now, how do you get wild grapes? You would assume that you just get grapes because somebody planted them. Wild grapes actually shoot off from, uh, you know, all this uh, cross-pollination and seed traveling where it was not supposed to travel and it starts to grow by itself. So no one really tends the vine and it brings forth wild grape. Now, God is saying, I'm not, I'm not responsible for that kind of seed that I did not plant and has now begun, has become full-grown uh, vineyards. He says, that's not me. I tend my vineyard. And when I tend my vineyard, I have the right to expect the best fruit out of them. So that's one side of the, the rebellious side of Israel that we see when they produce uh, wild grapes. Isaiah chapter 27 gives us the positive side of the vine, speaking of Israel still. And he says this from verses 2 to 6, says, In that day, a pleasant vineyard, sing of it. I, the Lord, am its keeper. Every moment I water it, lest anyone punish it. I keep it night and day. I have no wrath. Would that, would, that I, would that I had thorns and briars to battle, I would march against them. I would burn them up together or let them lay hold of my protection. Let them make peace with me. Let them make peace with me. In days to come, Jacob shall take root, Israel shall blossom and put forth shoots and fill the whole world with fruit. It speaks there of Jacob and uh, speaking of Israel there as a vine of the Lord. In the latter times, the vineyard of God is going to be grand. But now let's move on. Jesus now, understanding that his listeners know what he's talking about, makes a very, very important statement. And that's why this claim could rub people badly when they were hearing it. You and I have just read that Israel is the vine, the vineyard of God, or the vine. But now Jesus says, hey, listen to me, friends. I am the vine. <laughs> I am like the true Israel. I am the new order, if you want to say that. And he says, my father, who is God, the God of the universe, my father is the vine dresser. And then he introduces us now to our position. He says, and you are the branches. Now we have the vine, we have the branches, and then he says, every branch that does not bear fruit, I cut it off. And he says, but every branch that bears fruit, I prune it so that it can give quality and abundance of fruit. I want you to look that. Jesus is the vine. 
or the trunk, if you want to use that word. Jesus is a trunk. And we are the branches. And out of the branches, the vine dresser, who is God, goes around expecting to see fruit. And when he sees one of the branches, which is supposed to be fruitful, not bearing any fruit, he says, I'm going to cut it. And then when he looks at a branch that has potential and is bearing fruit, but feels it can bear more fruit, he prunes it. A lot of people, when they read the word pruning, they think of pruning the way you would prune your, your hedges or your bushes. But we'll come back to define the nuances of the word pruning that were all used in ancient Israel. My father, he says, is the vine dresser. You see, God continues to say this in John 15. And he says, for you to be fruitful, you need to stay connected to the vine. And he goes on to say this, verse 15. Abide in me, verse 4. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And so the secret to our fruitfulness, and I will define to you what our fruitfulness is, the secret to our fruitfulness is in remaining, as other versions say, or abiding in Christ. You see, friends, according to what Jesus is saying, the vine has no problem. There is never a problem with the vine. We could even claim the soil has no problem because out of this soil, the father owns the field and he has tended the soil and he has prepared it to plant the vine, and he has planted the vine. So the vine and the soil have no problem. He says the problem is with the branches. The branches tend to be affected even when the vine remains. And that's why when you read in Isaiah, you hear these words that out of the stump a shoot will grow because you can kill the branches, cut them out, but the stump remaining, the life of the tree remains in that trunk and it will come out. The vine has no problem. But when we do not remain connected to the vine, we will shrivel, we wither out, we dry, and we fall. He says, the only way for us to remain fruitful and to bring forth more fruit is to be constantly connected, to remain connected to Jesus. I want you to pause and ask yourself, what are the ways I can remain connected? In what ways can I be constantly connected to Jesus, who is the vine? You see, he says, branches that bear no fruit need to be cut off. Now, a lot of people ask this question, does he mean that I, who was already born again, that he will cut me off and he will throw me into hell? Well, friends, that's not what it means. First of all, you must appreciate the words he used that. In him. When we remain in him, he says, if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. The process of cutting is the process of discipline. You see, let's use a parent and children. Children, when they are in, when they are locked in, okay, when you're born in a family, you remain a child of that family no matter what. 
But there is something that can take you out of that family. It has nothing to do with the father's love. It has everything to do with our rebellious hearts. So for example, when a child is to be taken away or when, when someone is to be taken away from that family is when they have now gone against the rules, not necessarily the rules of the family. For example, if, if you're a good citizen, they've gone against the citizenship rules of being a good citizen. Now they're incarcerated, for example, they're taken away from their, from their parents. That's an act of their will. It's not an act. It's not an indictment on God and his love. And so it's not a punishment when God says, I'm cutting out. It's not punishment, but discipline. Those two things need to be defined clearly. God is not punishing me. God is disciplining me. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6 says this. And I love this reading this because it reminds me of the love of the Father in ways that I, I understand. Hebrews 12, 5 says this. And you, sorry, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? You can add daughters there. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be wary when he reproves you. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. And so you see something here when he says, the ones that do not bear fruit, and the seasons when we are not bearing fruit, friends, is seasons when we choose, we're already in Christ, already connected to Christ, but we choose to be rebellious. We choose to forget how to live a way that pleases God. We go against his will and we live recklessly. Those seasons do not necessarily take us away from God's love, but what they do, they stifle God's love for us. They prohibit God from reaching us. And God in his love breaks through by exposing us sometimes. God cuts through by stopping us in our tracks. God cuts through by bringing us the realization that we are living in sin. And sometimes it feels like it's embarrassing, but God is not out to embarrass you but is out to get your attention to tell you, my son, my daughter, you are going the way of destruction. And so he's cutting. That's the process of cutting, which is a process of discipline. And the Bible says discipline, while it is being administered, is never sweet or is never pleasant. And those are the unpleasant moments when God is taking a stand against what he knows has potential to destroy you or has already taken hold of you, but yet does not change his love for you. He already says you are in Christ. That's why the Bible uses the word, he who is in Christ. He says those who are now in Christ no longer are condemned. You are not condemned because you are in Christ. But being in Christ does not take away the place of God to discipline us. God will discipline those he loves. In fact, he goes on to say, if you are not genuine or legitimate children, he would not be disciplining you. He said discipline is for those who are God's. And he cuts those things that need to be cut out of our lives. He takes them away so that our lives can be fruitful. There's the next picture. So the branch that does not bear fruit is cut. The branch that bears fruit but has potential to give greater fruit, abundance of fruit, and quality fruit 
God says, that branch, I will prune it. And this is the beauty about pruning. So on the one hand, if you're reading the modern way and understanding of pruning, it involves some shears and you're able to prune and cut out some of the, the, the dry leaves and all that, you know, able to prune so that at the, at the back of it is so that you can give life to not just a few, but the quality of the fruit that you want to look out for. There is no benefit for a farmer to leave his grapes unattended and then they end up becoming the worst type of grapes at the end of the day. It will not give us the best wine. So he has to prune so that he gets amazing grapes, but also quality in the taste and abundance uh, in terms of uh, the number that he's looking for. So God is going to prune. One of the ways uh, in the Mediterranean they would uh, prune uh, grapes or, 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 or their vine, it would be that they would try, you know, when you have one of the branches literally just falling to the ground and it is going to struggle with the light and they would lift it up. The picture here we see of pruning is a picture of picking a branch that left to itself will self-destruct. It will be weighed down, it would fall to the ground, and it will not be able to lift its own weight. The, the farmer would lift that branch and tie it up again. And so that it could have the best view of the sun, or get the best sun coming up on it. And then it would be strengthened and it would give the best fruit in, as it's attached to the very, very uh, strategic position. So that's one way God would prune. He says he prunes it, he props it. You can use that word as one of, of the definitions and nuances of the word pruning. The other one is literally to cut out that which does not work for that piece of branch so that it can give you a lot more fruit. So you can see that broad spectrum of defining that word. And I love to use that picture of God lifting us from the ground so that we can have the best and strategic position so we can bear much fruit. God says, the branch that bears fruit but is compromised he will strategically strengthen it. But also, in real life, how does that happen? Sometimes God takes away the things we think we need the most. And sometimes when he does that, or God allows those things to be taken away, let me use that word, he does not necessarily take them away, but he allows those things to be taken away so that He could grow something great out of our lives. For example, God invites us to willingly a life of pruning. It's season in, season out. And he uses that, for example, in the life of fasting. So this is a willing pruning. This is a willing, uh, out of my will kind of pruning. There are times I need to cut things for my life so that I can give more time with God. By cutting away those things from my life, I give more time with God. Guess what? I grow and I bring forth fruit. Now, the times God has allowed sicknesses in my life and in your life, and I'm not saying God has brought the sickness. That's again, it's not factual in God's word. And God sometimes has allowed it. And as we see in scripture, when the, uh, when, when the man came to Jesus and says, Uh, This man has been sick from his from childhood. Uh, What did his parents do? Did his parents sin? No. He says, God says, no, no, no. This happened so that God would be glorified. And sometimes we ask ourselves, oh, why am I going through this? Why have I lost my job? And sometimes you ask yourself, what could God be bringing me into that I'm blinded to? And because of discomfort, I'm thinking, God, why are you doing this to me? 
And God's just inviting you to, I am helping you become more fruitful. And sometimes you need to be aware of what season you're in. Could I be in a season where God is changing my position, propping me again, and I feel uncomfortable because it means pulling me up, and I loved, somehow loved the way I was hanging, but in my limited view, I did not know I was missing something. God sees me and brings me up, and when he's bringing me up, it's painful, and I'm complaining about that painful process, but he says, no, this is for your good. Think about somebody who has a tooth that has a cavity and goes to the dentist and the dentist begins to drill through that tooth so that he could fill it in so that it could still be alive again and the person could have the best smile. But when you're going through that process, you do not see the love of God in it. You think to yourself, the dentist does not like me. It's a painful process, but when the dentist finishes his or her job, what you get the best smile and you still can hold and chew food with your teeth. Friends, God is a God of pruning and he will prune so that we can be fruitful. So what are these fruits that God is talking about? Fruits are the good works that come out of our lives. Fruits are the things that the Spirit of God brings forth. For example, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It seems like for us to show forth the world that we are disciples of Jesus, which means we are fruitful, if you want to use that word, it seems that our way of loving will be tested. But the testing is not to destroy us, it's so that we could be even more loving as Jesus is to us. And so I want to be fruitful. I want people coming around me to find that there is fruit in my life that they can take and enjoy. I want people to come closer to my life and realize I was kind and I was patient. But I also realize that for those fruits to come forth by the Holy Spirit, there will be pruning and sometimes there will be correction from the Lord. So I want to pray for you this morning or this day as you watch this. And as I pray, open your mind and your heart and say, God, what are areas that you want to cut out in my life today? I want to surrender that to you. And then what are the areas you want to improve in my life and prop me up so that I can become better? I want to submit also those to you. Our Heavenly Father, thank you that you're God who loves. And because you love us so much, you cut and you prune so that we can be fruitful. We can be a blessing. And so I pray for my listeners today that you would search our hearts and cut away that which is not yours so that we can continue to remain in you. We thank you, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen.